Well, thank you. That was good. Thank you very much. And thank you, Glenn, and others for leading us in a fine time of worship tonight. And I don't guess it's right to thank you for being here because you're here because you know you ought to be, but it sure is good to see you. And I'm glad to see this kind of congregation on a Sunday evening where some people say people just don't care to do this kind of thing anymore. I believe for a long time that people love a crowd. If you have a big crowd, a lot of people come. You know, small crowd, nobody shows up. It's always like that. And I'm glad you're here tonight, and I thank the Lord for that. We're about to do something very, very serious, just as we have been doing something serious. But this isn't serious because a preacher is preaching. It's serious because we're about to handle the Word of God. And I wish we could have just a word of prayer and ask God's Word, ask that God through His Spirit might make His Word alive to us and would help us understand that this is the way He speaks to us today. He intends us to take this Word seriously and to learn from it and pattern our lives by whatever we see there that would apply to how we live and what we do and what we are about. So let's, let's pray together now as we're about to study God's Word tonight. Father, I do thank you that you've given us your word. We believe, Lord, that you are its author, that salvation is its end, and truth without any mixture of error is its matter. We're grateful that in a world where we don't know who to trust nor many times what to trust, that there is a truth source that is really true, and it will benefit us to know it and to live by it and to learn from it and to learn the Lord it presents can come into our lives and change them. And I pray tonight, Lord, you would do that. In Jesus' name, amen. On Sundays or on the Lord's Day, that's what we're trying to learn to say around here, on the Lord's Day evenings, and then on Wednesday evenings, we've been looking at the book of Acts from the standpoint of saying there must be a reason why when the first century church met, things happened. And God blessed what they did. And we're going to, if we can, learn what that is and pray that we shall have the wisdom and the boldness and what my granddaddy used to call gumption to be that kind of church and to say, Lord, we want to be what you intended us to be when you said, now I will build my church. Now, Acts can be divided in many kinds of outlines. Uh, Acts 1.8 is kind of an outline of, of Acts. When the Lord said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And you can almost lay that statement by the, the history in Acts and see how the, the gospel spreads from Jerusalem to Judea, even into Samaria where those people are different, and then to the uttermost part of the earth as it ends in Rome. Another way of looking at Acts, according to some historians, is that Acts is a story of what the first church was about really what the message was, and then how that church was treated by the Jewish population of its day, and how that church was treated by the Roman officials and population of its day. That also is a very legitimate outline of the book of Acts. We're concerned about the first statement of that kind of breakdown. We want to learn what the church was about. What was its message? Was there one thing the church of the first century decided was more important than anything else? And so tonight we're going to look at chapter 4 and talk about the main thing. And pray, as my friend Carlos McLeod used to say, let's make the main thing the main thing as we do church in our lives and in our hearts. In the second chapter of Acts, we studied last Sunday night, that is, those people waited as Christ told them to, they waited for the power because there was no way they could do the thing he had asked them to do on their own. If he were going to depend upon human excitement and human enthusiasm and human organization and human ways of approaching things, then the best time for them to have gone quickly into the world was right after the resurrection. But now it's months later. And our Lord has said, I want you to wait. I want you to wait. And the Spirit will come upon you and he will give you that power. And because of him, you will be my witnesses. Now, really, if the Sermon on the Mount were all we had of Christianity, we would be, of all people, most frustrated. There's not a one of us who can do what the Sermon on the Mount tells us to do. If we just had the cross 
and the resurrection, we would be most frustrated because we would have something that inspired us and something that made us love the Lord and know that we, we have him, but we wouldn't have any power to be the people or do the thing he has called us to do. And just as the cross and the resurrection are very, very important and, and essential to Christian living, so is an understanding of Pentecost. Not that the cross is to be repeated again, not that the resurrection is to be repeated again, nor is Pentecost to be repeated again, but this is when God's Spirit came and began to flow through God's people and used ordinary people in very extraordinary ways as they simply allowed God to fill them and use them. We talked about the fact that when Jesus Christ comes into your heart, when you say, Lord, I am a sinner and I ask you to be my Savior, it is at that time that you are baptized of the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not call attention to himself. In John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, he will speak of me, he will glorify me, he will re help you remember what I have said. The Spirit does not call attention to himself. And yet the book of Acts could almost be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit of God. It shows what happens when the Spirit of God comes upon people and they begin to be people who magnify and honor the Lord Christ and they make the main thing the main thing. And so in the second chapter, we learned that, that as we are saved, we are baptized by the Spirit of God. But every day, more than just once a day, a continual lifestyle, the Bible says, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that means that we keep on confessing the sins in our life and getting those things out of our life that does, do not please God and filling up those empty places with the very Spirit of God. And we do that by faith. Not by feelings, but by faith. We simply invite God's Spirit to keep filling us and being the power within our lives. That's what happened at Pentecost. And you recall that, that they were given some signs, they were given some ability to do some things, but all of those things were not for showing off. They were not for demonstrating spiritual superiority. They were not even for demonstrating that the Holy Spirit was in them. The tongues and the fire... And the rushing mighty wind was a demonstration of the fact that only God could do these things and he equipped them to go out and tell in a language they didn't know other people about Jesus Christ. The, the equipping of tongues was not a thing for spiritual superiority or to indicate that the Spirit was in them. This gift of tongues was simply for communicating the word of Christ so it could be heard. Now Wednesday night, as we met in prayer service, we, we studied Acts 3. And talked to and saw there how that after this meeting had happened, as they were going to the temple, they met this beggar, and there they demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit that was within them. They very clearly made it known that this was done not with their strength, but with the strength of Jesus Christ, that all of this was about Christ. And so Peter once again preached a sermon, and he told them that this was because of Christ, that this thing had happened. And now in chapter 4, we're going to learn about the main thing. A church should know why it exists. A church should not be like the cowboy who jumped on his horse and rode off in all directions. We simply cannot do everything good that ought to be done. We cannot try to do everything good that ought to be done. We make ourselves nothing more than very weak mixtures of of, a, of an attempt to be another giant kind of civic club of some kind. We need to know what is the church about? What is the main thing? As we study this first century church, we learn that if we pay attention because it's on almost every page. Now beginning in chapter 4 in verse 1, it says, The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail till the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So here the church started at 3,000. Now the church has grown to 5,000. I told the group on Wednesday night that Forbes magazine, you know that Forbes is a business magazine. In an editorial in Forbes magazine, the, the editor said, this is a day 
when we desperately need a word from the church. And when we turn to the church for a word, all we hear is an echo of our own voice. We need to give the world the word from God. The world needs a word from God. The world does not need an echo of its own voice. The church is called to be in the world but not of it. We have become a church of people who are of the world but not so much in it. We act like the world. We think like the world. We gauge ourselves like the world. We, we do things like the world. And the world needs so much, desperately needs a word from God and where else are they going to get it except from the church? This church knew that. So here they were, not, not in their own little upper room meeting house, but they were out there in the temple where there was a place for free speech, and there they were telling about Jesus Christ. And the Sadducees, because they were saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection from the dead, and they were the power guys there. And so they got the authorities, and they arrested Peter and John, for saying these things about Jesus Christ. But this church was speaking the main thing. And when you speak the word about Christ, you're telling the thing that God wants told. That's very evident. When you're telling it, there will always be some people who don't like it. It's all right. But when you tell it, there's always going to be something good happen, and many people will be benefited because you tell it. The church grew to about 5,000 because they told him. They told about Jesus Christ. And they were empowered by Christ. Now you'd think that these guys would be outclassed. Look, listen to the words beginning in verse 5. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to count today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this. He's about to say to them again the thing that God once said. But this looks like a mismatch. I mean, here we're talking about the big guns. Remember Caiaphas? Remember Annas? These are the most powerful people in all the religious structure of that day. There were no Jewish people any more powerful than they were. And all of their family was there. All of the ruling aristocracy were there. And here were two fishermen, uneducated, untrained, it was very evident in the way they spoke and what they did. They were uneducated and untrained. In fact, it says so here. And so they said, by what power do you do this? And Peter said, I'll tell you the power. And he had the power. It says in verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. People, that's all we need, to be filled with God's Spirit, to be constantly being filled with God's Spirit to be constantly confessing sin, things that do not please God, to be constantly saying, Savior, I yield, long to be filled, praying thee now to receive me, searching my heart, bid to depart anything there that would grieve thee. And when that happens, then you invite God's Spirit to fill you and to use you for him. That's what Peter had. He was filled. And once again, he said the main thing. Listen, in verse 10, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. Here's a guy. He's talking to the big shots of his day. And he said, now know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. And he goes on to say, what is the authority by which we do this? It is Jesus Christ. What is our message? It is Jesus Christ. What is our power? It is Jesus Christ. Look in verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Everything is Jesus Christ. He is the authority. He is the message. He is the power. He is the only hope. This was their message. This was what they had to say to everyone. 
This is the only thing the first century church had to say. And they said it over and over and over again. And God blessed that. God blessed it. And we read here in, in verses 13, when they saw the courage, now these are the leaders, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and what did they see? And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That's what we're about. That's who we are. We're here to point through everything we do and say and are to Jesus Christ. There was on the Mississippi River down close to New Orleans a, well, a man who ran a tugboat, and he had a man on his boat who was pointing to the captain of another tugboat as it came by. And, and this man said, why are you pointing to that captain? He said, well, one day I fell into the river in an accident, and that man jumped in and risked his life and saved my life, and I sure do like to point him out. These people understood that they lived to point out Jesus Christ. They live to let people know that Jesus Christ is our message, that he is the indispensable presence. He is there. He is Christ. All right. They, they went through this meeting. Peter preached his sermon. These guys could not answer because the crippled man was healed, and they didn't know what to do. There was the indisputable power that God had done something there. And so then they sent them home and said, you say this stuff anymore, we thought we'd got rid of that Christ when we killed him on the cross. We don't want to hear any more about this. We're tired of this. We're sick of this. We forbid you to say any more about Jesus Christ or you're in big trouble. That's what they said. Loose translation, but that's what they said. Now look on verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Well, what would they do? What would we do? If I'd gotten put in jail and said, you folks are not supposed to do this anymore, it's against the law, I want you to shut up, quit meeting down there, don't tell any more about Christ, just be nice and religious and be kind to Granny and the cat and all that kind of stuff, but don't talk about Jesus Christ. And I came back and told you this, what would you do? Here's what they did. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And they said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. In verse 27 it says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what and only what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. They said, Lord, we know they didn't do anything you hadn't already decided would happen. And now, Lord, consider the, their threats. You realize what they're saying? They said, Lord, you're sovereign. You're in charge of this whole thing. You even let them crucify Christ. That wouldn't have happened if you hadn't allowed it to happen. And so now, Lord, they've threatened us. And please recognize their threats. And here's what we want you to do. What was it? Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Is that what you would have prayed? You might have said, Lord, keep those rascals away from us. Don't let them hurt us. Lord, protect us. Lord, show us a place to run to the mountains and hide. No, they said, Lord, help us in spite of all this to speak your word with boldness. That's what they prayed for. And then, it said, after they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. There's an affirmation. And here it is again. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they all spoke the word of God boldly. What's a church to be? That's it. That's it. They are people who are constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit for the purpose 
of speaking the message of Jesus Christ boldly, period. That's who we are. That's what we're about. And if we're going to be the church that God can use, then we must be that church. I must say to you again that you and I are facing almost the same thing those people faced. We know now that 38% of people who live in our country have no church background. That means they, don't, they haven't been to Sunday school. They haven't had a grandmother to tell them about Jesus Christ. They haven't had a parent who's ever prayed with them. That 38% of America in this land literally don't know what we're talking about when we talk about Jesus Christ. And if they're going to know, we're going to have to tell them. In fact, if we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what we will do. We will tell them. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. I'm going to ask in just a moment that those of you who want to make decisions and join our church, if you'll meet me over to the side here, just over there, somewhere between here and the American flag, well, then we'll, we'll greet there. And I want the rest of you, if you would, those who will, and maybe you want to pray where you are in your pews. But I'm going to ask you, would you dare come and kneel in the altar or stand in the altar or sit where you are and pray it, but to pray that God would make us that kind of church? Do you want us to be that kind of church? Are we really wanting to fulfill what it means to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you pray that God's Spirit would fill you and use you to do the main thing, to find ways in loving, natural manners to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's make the main thing the main thing. Those who would make decisions, when we stand, come over and meet me over here in this corner. The rest of you, as you would, come forward to pray or pray where you are. But let's have a prayer service now in which we, in our own hearts, ask Christ through his Spirit to baptize us with his Spirit and to help us to be the people he needs us to be. There are people around us who don't know what they must know, that Jesus Christ is the only hope they have for salvation. There's no other name given among men whereby they must be saved. If that is true, and we believe it is, don't we, then we better tell them. We'd better tell them. Let's stand quietly and reverently, and you come and do whatever you would to honor him.